In this video, we will derive the Schrodinger equation, which is the wave equation for quantum particles. So I have the derivation in quotes here because we can't quite derive the Schrodinger equation in the same way we've been deriving other results. So for one, the Schrodinger equation is usually taken to be a postulate. A postulate is something that you don't prove to be true, you just assume to be true, and then you see whether or not that was a good assumption by the validity of whatever the equation predicts. And similarly, we're not deriving the entire Schrodinger equation, we're just deriving the time-independent part, the spatial part. So the time-dependent Schrodinger equation will be coming in a video down the line in the next chapter. Okay, so let's look at our classical wave equation, which we use to derive the equations of classical waves. And let's start with that. So let's assume that our amplitude function, our wave function, is a spatial part times cosine omega t, as our time part was a cosine function in all the previous videos. Okay, so let's substitute this into our classical wave equation. Second derivative with respect to x is going to allow us to factor out cosine omega t and leave in whatever the second derivative here is of our wave function. That's equal to uh, 1 over v squared times second derivative with respect to t we can factor out the x part, doesn't depend on t. And cosine omega t, its second time derivative is negative omega squared cosine omega t. So we get a negative omega squared and a cosine omega t. Now we have a cosine omega t on both sides. We can cancel that out. <clears throat> and if we move over to the other side, uh, add, to, add to both sides omega squared over v squared psi of x, we have our equation. D, uh, second derivative with respect to x of the wave function plus omega squared over v squared times psi of x equals zero. Okay, so now let's deal with this omega squared over v squared part. So omega equals is the angular velocity, which is two pi times the angular frequency, nu, two pi nu. And the, and the velocity of a wave is equal to its frequency times its wavelength, v equals nu lambda. Okay, so we have omega squared is going to be 2 pi nu squared, 4 pi squared nu squared. V squared is lambda nu squared, so nu squared lambda squared. We have a nu on top and bottom, <clears throat> nu squared, which we cancel out. And that leaves us with 4 pi squared over lambda squared. Okay, so we have second derivative with respect to x of psi of x plus 4 pi squared over lambda squared times psi of x equals 0. All right, so our next move is going to be to get from this wavelength how to get at that. So the total energy of a particle, E, is equal to 1 half mass times velocity squared. It's also equal to momentum squared over 2 times mass. And then plus whatever the potential energy is. That's going to be the total energy kinetic plus potential. So if we solve this equation for P, we'll multiply both sides times 2m, subtract the 2m v, and then uh, take the square root. So we have momentum equals the square root of 2 times the total energy minus the potential energy. So this is true as long as our potential energy is independent of time and it's a conservative system, which they will be for quantum systems. Okay, so now how to relate momentum to wavelength? Well, according to the de Broglie hypothesis, lambda equals h over p. So we can take and substitute in there 4 pi squared over lambda squared. It's going to be 4 pi squared p squared over h squared, so that's 1 over lambda squared. So 4 pi squared over h squared, we know that h bar equals h over 2 pi. So h bar squared is h squared over 4 pi squared. So 1 over h bar, 1 over h squared is going to be, is going to relate to this. So 4 pi squared p squared over h squared equals p squared over h bar squared, which is going to equal, according to our equation, p squared is 2m e minus v. So we have 4 pi squared over lambda squared equals 2m times e minus v, total energy minus potential, over h bar squared. Okay, so let's take this result 
and substitute in for our 4 pi squared lambda over lambda squared now. We have the second derivative of our wave function with respect to x plus 2 times the mass times the total energy minus the potential energy function divided by h bar squared equals 0. Okay, so let's rearrange this. Let's subtract uh, this to the other side, making that a negative. We're going to multiply times h bar squared over 2m, and then we're going to and then we're going to move our v of x to the other side. You should be able to convince yourself that algebraic manipulation will get you from here to here, which is our final result for the time independent Schrodinger equation. That is negative h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative of our wave function with respect to x plus the potential energy function times our wave function equals the total energy times psi of x. So this equation here is the time independent Schrodinger equation. It gives us the wave function of our, of our particle. It gives us the total energy of our particle. And it does that by using its mass, h bar squared, its second derivative with respect to x, and the potential energy that it feels. So this is our equation where, uh, for our quantum wave particles. So the classical wave equation gave us classical waves. This is going to give us our quantum wave functions for any particle for which we can solve this. So what we need to specify in order to solve the Schrodinger equation for a given particle is we need to specify what does it weigh, what's its mass, and what is the potential energy that it feels versus versus position. Those two things specified, we can solve this equation, we can get our wave function, and we can get the energy of our particle. So now we're going to start applying this to specific model systems and seeing what we get.